Welcome everyone to our fourth workshop of this workshop series, Understanding Disability and Improving Accessibility, a deep dive into understanding neurodiversity. My name is Todd Trebor, my pronouns are he, him, and his, and I am the organization's program director at the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. <laughs> There we go. So before I wanted to, before I go any further, I wanted to start off our meeting with a land acknowledgement as is our practice for all our public meetings at the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. It is RISCA's practice to acknowledge that the grounds in which we are meeting are indigenous lands. Our offices in Providence and all of Rhode Island are on the ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Nation. RISCA is a committed ally and as artists, we honor the indigenous people, their ancestors, the culture and the artistic representation past, present, and future. We recognize the continued existence and contributions of indigenous people to our society. Again, thank you all for being here. I am charged with giving you all the rules of the road and some context for these workshops. So first off, adult as necessary. This is something that Janine and I are borrowing from our friend Bria Heidelberg of ISO Arts Consulting. That means if you need to go to the bathroom, if you need to take care of a, a person in your space, if your dog uh, you know, throws up in your carpet, whatever. Feel free to do what you need to do. Feel free to turn off your camera. Um, you know, we know that you're here, all right? Uh, just be here how you, how you can be here and need to be here. Uh, a little bit about why we're doing this workshop series. So uh, Randy Rosenbaum, our esteemed former executive director was the 504 accessibility coordinator for our agency. What that means, and I'll talk about that in a moment, is this person is in charge of accessibility efforts at our agency. It's a federally required uh, role. And when he retired, I became that person at the agency in the interim until we have a new executive director who can decide whether or not I will continue to do that. Uh, but brewing even before that, uh, we had come out with a strategic plan with our values around equity and access. And obviously we're implementing that um, and are on our own learning journey along with you all and are striving to improve on our efforts continuously as we know you all are as well. Uh, we sent out a survey in the fall to general operating support organizations, about 60 of them who make a good kind of sample when we're trying to just do, you know, kind of a, a, a to get a read of the field and what's going on. And we surveyed them about accessibility um, and, and equity questions that they have and work that they're doing. And one of the things that emerged was that small uh, and volunteer led organizations specifically struggle with implementing organizational diversity, equity, inclusion, and access work because a lot of the resources out there are geared towards organizations that are larger with staff, with larger budgets. And there's just a lot of resources out there, not a lot of guides in terms of how to access and use those resources and implement them. So that inspired this workshop series um, to focus mainly on small and volunteer led organizations. We say mid-size as well, because we know many mid-size organizations in Rhode Island have one or two staff people, if at all, and some of them are part-time, et cetera. So it's how to do these efforts when you have limited resources and time and how to do them in a way that is good and authentic and you know not bad. Um, that was what motivated this. Janine uh, from Arts Equity Rhode Island, who introduced herself momentarily, um, has been doing work in disability advocacy for many, many years. She will talk some about that. She's a trusted partner at RISCA. So we look to Arts Equity Rhode Island uh, to partner with an, an offering this series. The first two workshops were done by Dr. Bria Heidelberg of ISO Arts Consulting about initiating equity work at arts and culture organizations. And these last two are focused on accessibility and working with communities and people with uh, disabilities. This workshop focused on neurodiversity emerged again from those survey results that we saw where that was where people had the most questions at this point in time. You know, we'll be continuing to offering these kinds of programming moving forward and just be responsive in terms of what needs folks have. Related to that, you're gonna receive a survey and a follow-up email that also has a recording of this presentation later today. Please fill that out and let us know what other things you would like to learn about because we're deeply interested in obviously doing things that are relevant to you all. So a little bit about being the 504 Accessibility Coordinator and what that means for those of you who have seen the slide in front of you. As that person, that role, that means I serve as a consultant within RISCA about access issues. And I'm responsible for ensuring that planning for access is incorporated into all our organizational decisions. I go to you know, specific meetings for people in this role at state arts agencies on a regular basis. 
I'm the point of contact for the arts and culture sector in Rhode Island on issues of accessibility and access. So if you have questions about that or concerns, uh, you can feel free to reach out to me. And then uh, programming we are offering is part of this work. So this program you see here, there's also some other things that Janine and I have in the hopper, creating, like, creating an accessibility task force at our agency resource pages that will be ready probably later this week or early next week that will evolve over time and then the enforcement of ada and 504 requirements among grantees don't be terrified it's going to be fine i will reach out to you all about that and let you know what that means um, and some of you might already be doing those things uh, housekeeping for just how this is going to run i'm going to be monitoring the the uh, chat space for questions that I will make note of that we will answer in a Q&A session that will be at the end of this presentation. There might be instances where you ask questions within the chat where I'm like, ooh, this is super relevant. Let me kind of slide in there and, and interrupt Howie and Mario or, or Janine about what they're talking about. But just know, feel free to send them via the chat and we'll answer them in the Q&A session at the end. If you are someone that um, uh, can't access the chat, um, you, we will be able to unmute and ask questions at the end. And stunningly, I forgot the probably most important thing to lead off with in an accessibility workshop, which is closed captioning and how you access that. So please, uh, I apologize for that. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a CC. Um, you can click that CC and it will enable live transcription. Great, thank you, Janine. And now you will be able to see the rest of the things that I'm saying, as well as what our presenters will be presenting on along the bottom of your screen if you choose to have the transcription enabled. I think that is all the things. So I will turn this over to my friend and colleague, Janine Chartier. Janine, run with it. Once I move the slideshow. There we go. Janine, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> when everybody started Zooming, the corporation Zoom decided they were going to charge a lot of money to have people be able to do captioning. And we all, of course, went ballistic because it's as much communication as anything else. And after several lawsuits um, that got brought on them, they actually realized the error of their ways and made uh, the Zooming part free within their platform. So, you know, good for the community for getting things to happen and especially for us so we can add it to these kinds of workshops. So this is our overview um, for today. And same as last week, um, our vision is going to be that we see a world where difference, disability, or language are no longer barriers. We like to keep our vision really 10,000 feet sky blue because you never know what effect you can have. For example, even a small group of people in different states can actually affect Zoom on their decisions, and then that affects the entire world. So our goal will be to uh, enable participants, you all, to create lasting informative change about equity, diversion, inclusion, and of course, improve your access. And our smaller objective is that by the end of these sessions, you'll be armed with expert advice and practical solutions that you can take into making your organization's access plan. And in addition to these things that we will be presenting in these workshops, we are also creating um, a large resource area where we will have things that we don't need to read out loud to you and take up your time, but will be checklists having to do with um, all kinds of varying issues from uh, Lighthouse, which can tell you about color contrast and what size spots you need, to things about neurodiversity, to the NEA's basic um, quick checklist. So if any of you were ever writing grants to the NEA, it's very useful to have what they consider their checklist to be so you can improve what your um, grant knowledge is and, and get a better chance of getting some money. Um, 
First, I'm going to do a little housekeeping that we didn't get to last week. We didn't get a chance to talk about people first or identity language. So we'll be doing that. Then we have um, Mario Gomez with us, and he is going to do a deep dive into understanding neurodiversity. And we were going to have um, Annie Jankovic be with him, but she's out on the, the West Coast and things didn't quite work out. But she has also sent us in uh, a series of bullet point slides checklist that we will add to that resource list. So she will be able to participate accessibly in just a later way. Then we'll take a quick stretch and a break. When we come back from that, um, we will have the uh, uh, Ricky Davis from Riot. Uh, they are the co-executive director here, uh, there, and had just a great little episode happen recently that we um, thought it would be great to share with you. Then we're going to go back to some of our evolution of access and what is going on in our local landscape, highlighting a few things, talking about um, open captioning, sensory friendly performances, and giving you an example of a, a simple social story narrative that has been picked up from um, the larger world of disability and now brought into um, theater and other places to adapt to their spaces and situations. So that's great. And then we have Howie Snyder and Steel Yard. And um, I love Howie. And he allowed me to put this down <laughs> as to, because there were so many of us that in our uh, surveys that we did earlier said, I don't have a disability. I'm the only one running my organization. Where do I start? So Howie and the Steelyard have been at this for many years now and still learning and still growing. So he's going to be great and come on and talk to us about the access guide and more things that he has, including inviting us to events he's doing in the fall. And then we'll have time left over at the end for some uh, questions and answers and some discussion. So before we get into that, though, I just want to point out to you this little cartoon here, um, where, of course, it says the system and this person running the system fits perfectly through the door in the system <clears throat> and says, we're going to have to change everybody else, you know, to fit in the system. And here we all are. I consider this we all. We're not the shape of the system. We're different colors, we're in the arts and cultural community. And what we wanna do is know how to change the system so that we can all fit in together. And when this popped up in a stream of mine, just about a month ago, it brought back this idea to me of, you know, 55 years ago, um, when I was being a, a young hippie and, um, I remember myself clearly saying to people, oh man, don't be so square and part of the system. And here it is all these years later that we're still kind of saying stuff about being square and, and the system. But you know, even though we are still saying that, that larger idea, we've made a lot of amazing changes in the system. And so small steps, yes, but we've been through all kinds of civil rights movements and the feminist movement, the disability advocacy. We went through uh, HIV AIDS advocacy and ACT UP more recently with Black Lives Matter. So I do feel that the system is changing, but I still think it's, it's a good idea for those of us who are the colorful artsy creatures to still work on pushing it and making it more so. So now um, we're just going to go into some of the housekeeping from last week. And where we talked about, we ended up talking about how disability is a social construct created by social barriers. And those barriers can be eliminated. And a lot of those barriers came out of prior models that were about medical and charity. And so those things developed into systematic biases that favored certain groups over others. And they had set up a pattern of norms and rewards and expectations, opportunities, who got recognized, and all of those things built themselves 
into our laws and our policies and our practices. And because it started out in that big systematic way, architecture was all big steps going up to, you know, where Caesar sat or who got rewarded, you know, in our smaller little Rhode Island way, it was always, you know, I know a guy. And um, <laughs> so all of those things just got built into, built into the groundwater we have, built into the work we do. And so some of it was taken on by us as individual biases, where we thought and had actions that supported those larger systems. And it became lessons that we learned from the systematic biases that we didn't even necessarily know we had. But now we're working on building in systematic solutions. And one of the most popular ones and most popular ideas of one is the curb cut effect. So after ADA was passed, um, they made an investment in all our towns and cities, in Washington, D. especially, where they put in these um, curb cuts. And it was initially done for wheelchair users so they could go up and down without bumping into the edge of those curbs. <laughs> and it got put everywhere. And now we just expect them to be there and everybody expects them to be there. Delivery people, oh my God, the guys who deliver beer to your bar, loves that they're there. The um, women who are pushing baby strollers and other people who are just out in the world that, um, you know, the silver tsunami is happening. We're all getting older and using canes and walkers. And so now knowing that those curb cuts are there are really beneficial to everybody throughout the entire system. And we no longer have to worry about that. And everybody sort of gets that idea and now builds it into not only just out on the street where the city has to do it, but builds them also often within their own personal spaces. And so that's great. So thank you, Todd. Um, yeah, so last week um, we talked about many stigmas and segregations that, uh, that disability had been throughout history and how our ableist world got to this place that um, we're living in. Our contemporary world, though still doing better, still carries a lot of those stereotypes into our work and our language is, is some of that work. And I have to say and confess, I am terrible bad at language. I have things that are stuck in really old file drawers that sometimes pop out of my mouth without me even being aware that I'm saying it. So I get that it's hard. I get that it's not easy. I get that sometimes we slip out. But as long as we are learning it and we're saying, apologizing for it and saying to ourselves, yes, I will do better next time. It, it's that positive reinforcement will overtake some of those um, exclusionary things of uh, which we used to be part of. So out of advocacy came a couple of things and two of them out of those models and it's still moving along because we have a huge disability diverse community who doesn't always agree on everything. And we're in two places, we're in people first or identity first. So people first language began out of uh, uh, throwing ourselves up against the medical model who only wanted to describe us as our person that was our disability, our person that was our deformity. <laughs> and so they would just say that, a disabled person, um, an autistic person. And a lot of this also happened a lot in the, um, in the AIDS era, AIDS and HIV, because everybody was being described as he's an AIDS patient and just totally ignoring all of the other things that that person was. And really um, advocacy led to person first language. So now it's about, you say the person first. So it's a person with a disability. So a person with a developmental disability or a behavioral disability. So a person who is deaf or hard of hearing or a person of short stature and saying, oh, that dwarf, we say, 
oh, the person of short stature. And so that was our first big movement into changing things. And I have to say, some of that is what you need to know in order to write grants. That is still the basic format if you write a grant to the Department of Education, the NEA, and many other places. They want you to use person first language in those grants. And so pay attention to when you're doing some of that because it really will affect somewhat how your organization is viewed as to whether or not you're really authentically buying into the disability advocacy movement. And then as that rolled on, identity first language also began working into the culture. And that language I, I emphasizes that the disability plays a really core role in who the person is and reinforces that disability as a cultural marker. People did not want anyone to think that they were stigmatized by their disability or embarrassed by their disability. So they wanted to put it up front so that people would know. So thus it became disabled person and autistic person. And oh, by the way, this idea of the the uh, thus disabled person. That's how I personally write disabled. I write dis with a backslash and able. And I use that just as an umbrella term because again, when you write grants, you have to work your way down to maybe sometimes smaller character numbers. So by using disabled, I am including everything from people with physical disabilities, sensory disabilities, people who are neurodiverse. It's just sort of uh, one way of, um, of, again, bringing that in without having to then list out all the separate little categories. Um, and so if a person prefers identity first language, respect that. Sometimes you may say something and they will remind you that, oh, that's not a word that we use or how I phrase something is this, so, or you can just ask. It's very much the same as what we're going through with pronouns and whether or not you're uh, prefer to be they or he or she. Um, definitely though, there's the things that are not to say. And those are these clumping categories where you call people the disabled or the handicapped. To my understanding, and it might be folklore, handicapped came out of this place that was very much the charity model. You, had, you couldn't get a job, so you had to sit or stand on a corner and beg for money in order to live. So you would hold your cap in your hand and that's how you would make a living. And it was you know, very much a stigma, but very much to what we were very limited to before we started doing advocacy work. So these other words, cripple, retarded, simple moron, and again, victim of. People all the time, instead of just saying that, for example, me, I'm a survivor of polio. Yes, I had polio, but I am not a victim of it. I dealt with that disease and moved on. So those kinds of things, suffers from or victim of, put people in a really pitying place that is really wrong and tends to make us look like, you know, we're defective and we're not into that. And so again, same thing with words like insane or crazy or stuff that have lived for so long in our language a little while ago, I was over at AS220 and there was a bunch of kids running around up and down the stairs. And one of the kids said to the other kid, without even thinking about it, just again, out of some file cabinet in the back of his head, looked at the other kid and went, oh, that's so retarded. And the child did not have a diagnosis of mental retardation. So in any shape or form, it was real. And I really had to stop and pull the kids aside and say, oh, by the way, don't do that. Because I don't think anybody had ever explained it to them before because they were insulted that I did that. But finally, it made some sense to them. And, and so there are still ways out there that we can really work on 
changing this kind of language. And one of the languages, one of the words that we're working on changing now is special. I don't know if any of you remember, but a number of years ago, before I became arts equity, we had been very special arts. It had grown up out of the time of uh, the Kennedys and Eunice Shriver started Special Olympics and Jean Kennedy started Special Arts. Special at that time was a code word for not saying retarded. Everybody knew retarded was bad and they didn't know what to say. So they all just started saying special and that bled into our society. And now in some places we're stuck with it. I don't think special, we, we as very special arts changed our names so we weren't carrying it around. Um, Department of Education has offices of special education. And again, trying to work on modernizing that, but you know, this stuff takes a really long time. Um, but please try not, unless you're referring specifically to the Office of Special Education or Special Olympics, please try not to use it. Don't say that children have special needs because they have a disability. All children have all kinds of needs. And so for breaking it out in that way is really quite a, a shaming and derogatory way to go about it that we just haven't figured out how to ameliorate yet. And the next thing is of course, wheelchair bound, which I hear on TV almost every other day, some reporter saying something about this person who is wheelchair bound. Wheels give us access. Wheels help us get everywhere. Um, it doesn't matter if it's in a Segway or what your wheel device is from a little quickie wheelchair that you can do sports in or a big power one run off a battery. Wheelchairs give us access. I know the bound thing every once in a while, I think of like, oh, it could have an S&M edge to it and uh, it doesn't. Bondage is not what they're going for here. They're, again, they're using it in a very pitying kind of way. And it's not what wheelchairs do for us. When I use a wheelchair, it helps me get someplace. So a wheelchair is a very positive webinar piece in my life. That was school. So was the, other one piece, school today. the other one piece I have that goes back to grant writing and because of people first or other kind of language is that this is just something I've used. I have no idea if it's authoritative or not, but early on in the grant, there will be a space where you can talk about what your larger goal for your program is. And in, within that larger goal, I might say something like, my programs will conduct outreach to and accommodations for persons with disabilities. So if I use that phrase, I'm using up to 31 or 32 characters. Now, in other places in the grant, you're very limited. You might only have 150 characters. You might only have 500, whatever it is, but you can't keep using that 31, 31, 31 because it eats up everything you want to say. So I have done it by saying person with a disability and then putting in um, P, W slash D within that enclosure that means this will be an acronym that we will use later on. An acronym, no, that's not the right word, but you know what I mean. So then later on in the rest of the grant, I will just use the PWD. And all my grants have gotten fine through with that. People know what I'm talking about. And that's what um, is able to happen. Um, is that my last one, Todd, or do I have one more? Oh yeah, I do have more. I'm coming back to those later. So right now, thank you very much. We're gonna go over to Mario. All right, thank you, Janine. Thank and you. Let me give a quick intro for Mario while Mario pulls up his PowerPoint. Uh, so Mario Gomez is a theater artist, advocate, excuse me, and nonprofit leader based in Providence. Since 2013, Mario has focused on supporting organizations that center and are led by communities that have been historically excluded in our society. 
Mario's work has focused especially on supporting BIPOC and disability communities. Mario has also led workshops about accessibility practices at Brown and the Kennedy Center. Thank you so much for being us, uh, with us here today, Mario. We look forward to hearing from you right now. So take it away when you're ready. Are you on a break? I, I, thank you, Todd. And I just unmuted myself. So, hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you. So, today I want to talk with you about doing that neurodiversity deep dive, as much of a deep dive that we can do in about 20 minutes. So, just I want to introduce myself a little bit more. So, I've been in the arts and the nonprofit world since 2008. That has taken me to a very, I've been very privileged that that has taken me all around the world and working with people from all five continents, uh, no, sorry, different country. So five continents out of the seven that exist. I've done a lot of work in theater in my, in this uh, last 14 years. So I've actually been around and I do want to share that I do identify as neurodivergent. I have done a lot of work with organizations like that are that center and are led by people with disabilities here in Providence, some in Seattle, some around, and most of them and most of them have been on the smaller side or growing. So a lot of the things that we can talk about are things that you can actually use and implement easily on your everyday practice. So, in this next twenty minutes. I'm just going to give you some definitions and then we'll talk about some things that we need to keep in mind as we think about neurodiversity, about uh, neurodivergence and about people. And then some of the things that we can implement on our day-to-day -day practice that actually don't require that much time or resources. It's, they'll just be a first step into the uh, work to really become a, to really make our organizations more inclusive and more accessible. So one of the things that I do want to share with, and this is one of the principles that I do take with me in every, that informs my work, is that, and I just generalized it, is that the arts should serve people. People shouldn't serve the arts because as we know, especially in the nonprofit world, we do a lot of work to make things happen, that the show must go on. And sometimes that's at the expense of our own well being, at the expense of uh, other people's well being or equitable practices. Whereas the arts should be the ones that are serving us, that are uplifting us on the work that we're doing, the stories that we're sharing, the uh, feelings, the emotions, the work that we're doing. So everything that I'll be saying now. Oh, everything that I will be sh sharing with you comes from there, that we should put people first in everything that we do. Because that's after all why we're doing this. And yeah, and if not everyone can participate or not everyone can have access to what we're doing, are we actually fulfilling our missions in our nonprofits, in our art, in our own individual lives, if we're just excluding people, whether explicitly or without realizing it. So our first definition. So, and this is actually one of the things that's actually one of the uh, larger, let's say misconceptions that neurodiversity is uh, just about the people that have a condition or that have a disability. No, actually neurodiversity encompasses the entire spectrum of uh, how our minds, our brains work, how, they, how we process the world, how we, navigate it, how we understand the other people. It's the entire spectrum. And then that's where we go into two other definitions, a neuro neurotypical and neurodivergent. Neurodiversity, uh, sorry, neurotypical is the people whose brain functions and behaviors fit what is considered normal, what's considered standard or typical. Neurodivergent, well, refers to everyone else. Uh, a lot of the way that neurodivergent is defined nowadays is about 
people, for example, who are in the uh, ASD, the autism spectrum, or who have ADHD or learning disabilities, and so on and so forth. But I want to ask you, so what is actually normal? So I do want to ask a little exercise from you. In the chat, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question, and I just want you to answer one of the options. It's multiple choice. So when you think about yourself, would you say that you're better at writing, at public speaking, at math, or at um, manual arts? All right, seeing a variety of responses, speaking, writing, math. Great, so now I want to ask you a question. So which one of these is, is normal? Which one of you is normal? And the, which of the other three are different? That's what we're talking about, what, what normal is, because a lot of what we consider normal what we consider neurotypical is actually a very, very narrow definition that we've put on it. And well, unfortunately that definition has been, for example, in this country, it's been, if you're white, male and, cis, uh, and straight, straight and cisgender, you're normal. Everyone else deviates from that. And then if you have a, feel a narrow definition of, uh, how you should behave, then that's normal. So a lot of these definitions about neurodiversity and neurodivergence actually are problematic because of that, because we have defined normal or neurotypical in such a very narrow way that we don't take into account the wide spectrum of uh, the human experience, which takes us to the spectrum. So. On the left, we actually see what we usually think of. Uh, actually, some of the things that I, when I first started this, work, thought of uh, what the spectrum was. That on one end we had a, what was considered neurotypical, and then you go and change into, oh, you're more neurodivergent, or you have a, or you're the further down the spectrum, the more neurodivergent you are. But that's actually not the case. Our brains are complicated. We're complicated. So the spectrum is, you can visualize it more as a circle with multiple dimensions. That, hey, well, we, and this is for example where, where the example that I gave you fits, that some of, some of us might have a slightly larger take on the dimension that represents writing. Some of us maybe lower on the one that's about math. Some of us maybe slightly lower on the one that's about reading verbal, sorry, nonverbal cues. Some of us maybe are really high on the, hey, on, uh, on lang processing language or spatial capacity. So, which is actually what we should be thinking about, how we should be thinking about neurodivergence, neurodiversity, that it's so, you no, know, it's so complicated that we actually need to, but, Sorry, I need to backtrack that. That it's uh, all of our brains are complicated so that we can't really group people into one group or another. That we need to think about how we can support everyone as much as we can. Just like the example that Janine was giving earlier about the uh, curve cuts. Sometimes if we do something that supports someone then we'll rediscover that that actually helps other people in ways that we haven't realized before. So this is just a bullet point list of things that we, I was already talking about, about all of our brains are different that we, I mean, as a society, as a civilization, we still don't understand our, how our brains really work fully or how our bodies really work in, in its entirety. We, sometimes actually know more about outer space than we do about our own brains. So, and that's why a lot of times we've let societal cultural norms uh, that have existed 
inform what are definitions of normal. And like with pronouns, like with race, we need to really think, so who benefits by defining what is normal? And why do we need to do this? Why do we need to challenge those assumptions and really bring uh, everyone to the mix and support them in the way that we want, that we can? And so our, under, and our understanding of a definition of a, I'm sorry. And that's one of my access needs that I, sometimes I just need to take a little breather in between words or sentences. So, so uh, thank you for your patience. So our understanding of neurodiversity is constantly evolving. I just, as uh, Janine was saying earlier, we went from using words for people like, actually, if we go way back, we're, have you all heard about the stories about like the myth with the folklore about changelings, which were about when the myth that uh, uh, fairies or fates or other mythical creatures would come in the night and take a baby and just substitute it with someone with a baby that wasn't uh, that was different, that wasn't quite human. Well, as uh, people and scholars have been thinking about that, they actually think that that might be one of the uh, Ex earlier explanations of, of uh, autism or of uh, being North of certain North American uh, conditions that are, because some of them don't first of all manifest uh, until later in, in our development process. Not maybe not when we're born, but maybe a few months in or a year or more. And that's where that story came from. And then we started going into special and for example, Asperger's syndrome that is something that you might have heard. But then as we, our understanding has even evolved in the last 20 years, that actually Asperger's syndrome has actually gone out of, uh, fallen into use because we've uh, come to understand that it's part of the larger autism spectrum. So what I'm going to say is that our definitions change, our understanding change, changes. So as we're doing this, we need to understand that we need to keep trying to keep up to date. We need to understand that what is going on, what the vocabulary is, but also what the knowledge is. And if you can't, it's important that you are actually listening to the people in the communities that are able to keep up with that, that they know their own bodies, that they know their own communities. So for example, one of the things that I do want to mark here is that, uh, as Jenny was saying about uh, the terms that we that have been in use, I do want to call out that uh, one of the words that uh, were used, the R word, is actually in many neurodivergent circles, in many communities with autism is, uh, or neurodivergence, is, is actually considered a slur. And so I would ask you that as one of the things that you take away from this is that you treat that word as such, because uh, people have been bullied with it. They have been, uh, uh, people have caused harm to them. They have been, uh, the has been enacted on these people with, through that word. So it actually, just like other words, we need to be very careful about how we use it, about, using it, or if we have to use it for absolutely, for some reason, that we need to be very careful on how we frame it and the warning that we might need to give people or the support that we need to give people. Thank you. Oh, I, so one of the things that I, we need to keep in mind is that a diagnosis for neurodivergence is, is not required when someone asks for a, uh, for support or recommendations, because we don't have access. To, a lot of us don't have access to a diagnosis. Some of us, for example, if we're from a, a BIPOC or immigrant community, we don't really have access to the medical establishment in this country to get a diagnosis. Uh, for example, uh, women historically, because a lot of the markers, for example, for some things like autism, some of the symptoms are actually things that society has been uh, expecting women to behave like or to do. And so a lot of women, for example, or non-binary folks have been underdiagnosed and undiagnosed historically. Some of us, uh, let's say if we're 40 years or, or older, 
we also lived in during a time where we didn't really have an understanding of what we were. We were just considered eccentric or a little weird. So we may not have that. Or there's a stigma about, oh, I have a learning disability or ADHD or PTSD that I, we don't want to bring up, whether professional, professionally or personally. So, if, so we don't need to, we shouldn't require a diagnosis when we're thinking about this and when we're asking, <clears throat> giving these accommodations. And one of the things that I take with me is that if you've met one neurodivergent person, then you've met one neurodivergent person. You can't generalize on experiences or on needs of other people. So I, since I'm running short on time, I will just go through some of the uh, basic things uh, that we can do, that we can implement on our everyday uh, practice. Uh, so first is that work starts on day minus one. For, for example, if you're doing a production, uh, doing a theater production, when you need to start thinking about accessibility and accommodations or asking about them before you even start meetings on productions. So because uh, the earlier you do this, the easier it is to uh, provide the accommodations or find ways to work with uh, the people that need them or find interpreters or the cart machines or whatever you're using. Because the further along you get, in the process, the harder, the harder it is, the expensive, more expensive it becomes, and well, the, least effect, the less effective it'll be. Ask, ask and honor access needs. But as I was saying, respect people's privacy and boundaries. Don't ask for what the, how we can support you, not why we need to support you. Uh, challenge your assumptions. A lot of uh, things, because a lot of things, as we were defining what is normal, has actually permeated how we do our own work. If someone, for example, in a meeting starts fidgeting or doodling or something that we consider, oh, that's unprofessional, they're not paying attention, they might just be their way of uh, managing their own energy levels or managing their own stressors so that they can actually pay attention. Or maybe if someone's uh, late, something, in a somewhat regular basis, it might be because there's an unmet access need, something that we're not supporting them with. So don't assume because of things that we've worked before, how we've worked before, that sometimes that, that's something that uh, is actually a reflection on the person, might be a reflection on the system, our society, or how we're actually working with them. Uh, build time for people. And this is easy to explain because it's something that, like Todd mentioned earlier, it gave people time to, when he said uh, adulting, hey, you do adulting on your own time. You know your own body, you know what your own needs are. So if you, as we're working, let's make space and give, make sure that people know that they can leave the room if they need to go to the bathroom, if they need to take care of their bodies, if they just need to take, take a time and find a quiet space just so that they can regulate their own brain, their own body, their own emotions at the moment. And then what we can do is offer people, hey, yes, feel free to go out uh, and take care of yourself, but it's your, but you then find a way to come back in and we should support them in a way to bring them, bringing them back in. And as such, we also need to build time. And this is really important as we're planning for any event, any project, anything that we're doing, we should build a time for people to take care of themselves. If we're thinking, oh, oh this project needs to take, uh, will take, let's say two months, then maybe we should add a little bit more time because people all well, have lives, they have bodies, they have brains. So just uh, bringing them in and just building that time in so that the project can still be made on time, but that people are taking care of, that they're not putting themselves in harm's way just to make something happen. And that goes for you all too, not just for people that you're working with. Uh, share information early, and this is really useful for when you're working. Uh, I mean, this is good business practice, but it's really useful for people with learning disabilities, or for example, who are in the ASD in general. We like to know what we can expect. So 
share agenda schedules, uh, uh, warnings, content warnings as early as you can so that people can come prepared or be prepared to do something. Also, share accessibility info from, for your space or where you're meeting as early as you can. Because again, that will also let people make an informed decision of uh, how they can participate or whether they can participate or what do they need to ask to participate. Uh, your, your work, anything that you share, that you build, keep it simple. A lot of uh, times we like to uh, show how good of a writers we are. Sometimes uh, we just go on because we don't uh, 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 have the time to actually edit things down. But the more that we can actually keep things simple and easier to understand, it helps uh, everyone, not only people with, uh, that might have, uh, for example, uh, dyslexia, who might have a uh, hard time reading, but also people with uh, English as a second language or third language, or even people that we were in a hurry. And this is something that, for example, the government, uh, the federal government has uh, implemented the use of a uh, plain language which is basically use a uh, right and second person as much as you can. So you are going to expect this, or you should uh, 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 submit this form by this date. Use the active voice and just use uh, bullet points and clear headings. So that's something that we can use easily. And something that can also be helpful is uh, if you build a guide on to your space, like, Hey, to this event, you'll come through this door. Go to here's the box office to your left, where you will pick up your ticket, and then you will go into this space where the performance will begin later. That's also something that we find really, really helpful and useful. Uh, train your staff, volunteers, and audiences. So pretty much everyone needs to be aware of uh, what's going on. If, for example, we invite people who have sensory. Uh, 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 who are prone to have a sensory overload into our uh, performance space. And they start fidgeting because as a way to regulate. Well, what happens if someone in the audience doesn't like that and calls an usher and takes that peep and drives that people away, that person away because uh, they're being disruptive. Then we actually cause much, a lot of harm to that uh, person instead of supporting them. So that's why we need to uh, ensure that all our the people that are working with us, just supporting us, know what, what to do or how can we invite people in a way to a different space where they can recharge or also our audience members to let them know, hey, this is a place where people can engage with their bodies and the performance in any way that they want. This is not a place where we'll all be really quiet and just clap at the end. And for example, the example that I gave you that they shared about the person in uh, that was having uh, an event and was carried out by, by an usher and caused more harm to them was actually a real thing. Uh, was actually, it actually happened in an organization here in Rhode Island. So it's not a theoretical example. It's something, something that has happened. So we need to be mindful of sharing and training with that. If you are interested, uh, the Fifth Avenue Theater in Seattle actually shares recently an audience code of conduct where they do touch on a little bit of this on what we can expect and how we can engage uh, with performances there. So that might be uh, an interesting resource to explore. And again, just I want to reiterate, put people first in whatever we're doing. Our organizations, the arts should serve people. We shouldn't serve them at our expense. So quick summary, there's no such thing as a normal brain. Our understanding of neurodiversity and our brains is constantly evolving. So we need to keep up as much as we can. Racism, classism, sexism, transphobia, all, all of that amplify ableism. Especially racism is an amplifier for a lot of these things. So we cannot think about uh, accessibility without thinking about this. Uh, other things. Uh, we cannot think, uh, think of it and address it in isolation. We can do some steps, to, we can take some steps to move forward to make our place more accessible, 
but to really become an inclusive, accessible, accessible space, we really need to think about uh, the entire environment. And finally, ask do your research, but start doing it. Because a lot of times we get stuck into the, oh, I need to know what to do and make it perfect instead of starting to do baby steps. And please feel free to reach out to me if I can, if you think that I can be of help. At some point, I've done some work already, so this is, and something that I shared with students at a previous uh, workshop is a reminder that the show does not have to go on. We do, people do. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. I hope you all can hear me and see me. Yes, you can. Great. Thank you so much, Mario, for that. Um, uh, and as Mario said, you know, he's available if you all need uh, support. Um, I'm sure, Mario, I'll disseminate your contact information when I send out the follow up email. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break now. We're going to come back at 12.05. We'll then hear a little bit from our friend Ricky Davis at Riot Rhode Island before Janine talks a bit and builds on some of what Mario shared. Um, when when Denise talks about uh, social stories and open captioning, and then we'll hear from Howie Snyder, and then we'll have some Q and A. So go ahead, take a be back at twelve oh five. If you're someone with your camera on, go ahead and turn it off and turn it back on, so I know you're back. And I'll see you in a few minutes.
And we're back. Sorry, everyone, I was a minute late. Um, we are going to hear now from our friend Ricky Davis, if Ricky is indeed here and returned. Sure am. Yes, awesome. Thank you, Ricky. Let me kick it off with a little intro for Ricky. And my computer wakes up again. So uh, Ricky's great. Uh, and Janine and I invited Ricky to just share for a few minutes um, about Riot Rhode Island, where Ricky is a co-executive director, uh, who they are and what they do, and what experience Riot Rhode Island had working with individuals who are neurodiverse, um, and why and how um, they address physical accessibility um, with Riot Rhode Island spaces after a conversation with Janine. So an organization doing great work when it came to access that kind of has continued that work in the different areas and fields that kind of rings on some of the themes that we're talking about today. Ricky, I will let you take it away from here. Cool, thanks, Todd. Uh, yeah, so like Todd said, I'm Ricky, I use they, them pronouns. Um, quick intro of me, I am a musician, a vocal instructor, a gender justice activist, and the executive director at Riot RI. Um, I'm also, I'll claim the identities of trans, non-binary, and gender, gender diverse, also neurodiverse uh, myself. Um, so Riot, if y'all don't know about it, used to be called Girls Rock Rhode Island. Uh, we changed our name a couple years ago. Um, so we're Riot Rhode Island now, and we are a volunteer-run nonprofit that uses music creation, critical thinking, and collaborative relationships to foster collective empowerment in girls, women, trans, and gender expansive youth and adults. Um, so to take out the complicated language on that, music is the tool, empowerment is the goal at Riot. Um, and we're a social justice org that is trying to use music as a force for change. Um, so our big program over the summer is Youth Rock Camp where all of these kiddos, girls, trans and non-binary or gender expansive youth learn how to play an instrument, join a band, write a song and perform live in a week. It's a whole thing, it's really cool. Um, I'll tell you more about it in the lens of accessibility right now. Uh, so first I'm gonna jump in on what we currently do for neurodiverse participants um, and where that comes from. And I also wanna share kind of some places where we were not where we wanted to be in accessibility and how we have tried to remedy that over the course of the past few months. Uh, so for neurodiversity, um, one thing that really influences how we can create accessible spaces is having the voices of people who experience those uh, limitations or barriers to access uh, in places of power. So we found that having a number of neurodiverse folks on the board and staff meant that we were able to provide access and a space where belonging was um, prioritized for our camp program, um, but that was not the case for folks with limitations physically, um, especially knowing that we have a space that requires six steps to entry. So for our neurodiverse participants, basically there are two things that we do to make sure that we are creating accessibility and belonging in our space. The first one is creating a culture and the second one is having the tools. So for creating a culture that is welcoming to our neurodiverse participants and staff. First, everybody involved in our organization, we're a tiny organization, only two people in full-time roles, uh, but a hundred volunteers. We make sure that every single person, all hundred volunteers are undergoing a 10 hour training in socio-emotional support for the kids we work with, especially those uh, who are experiencing ASD, ADHD, anxiety, PTSD, trauma, et cetera. So we make sure that we have an expert come in and share their knowledge about that, get everybody on board. Um, and that's a required training. People are not allowed to volunteer unless they've gone through that training. The other piece is creating a culture of behavior as communication. And I was really uh, psyched to see Mario talk a little bit about that um, among adult participants, but um, like folks in meeting who are doodling, et cetera. The same thing goes for young people. Um, oftentimes folks who experience neurodiversity are considered disruptive in classes. And we really wanna make sure that that behavior is um, seen as a form of communication rather than disciplined um, and having those students singled out. Uh, so that is one piece. And then the other piece is having a counselor and a teacher in a room at all times. 
So we are not putting um, like classroom management in the hands of someone who knows how to teach guitar. Um, we're making sure that we have someone who can really focus on the needs of the students in the space, make sure that everybody is on board with um, learning the material and also feeling good in the space, resolving conflicts in a healthy way um, with multiple adults present and ready to work through all of whom have gone through this training. So that's the culture creation piece. Then there's the tools. We have a very loud program. Literally one of the things that we say is get loud on purpose. One of our intro activities is that we'll have everybody scream. Uh, so that can be very overwhelming, especially for folks who have sensory uh, processing needs. So what we make sure is that we have a chill zone at our camp, a quiet room where we can provide headphones, earplugs, and sensory toys for students who need a break. And honestly, for staff who need a break from the loud space. Um, I definitely made use of that myself. Uh, and then the other piece is sort of allowing some clear expectations around social engagement. We have a very short camp. Um, it's only a week long, and that can be really tough for some kids to make you know, 80 new connections in a week. Um, it can be really overwhelming. So what we do is we give everybody a name tag. That name tag has a little circle on it, and we give everybody a sheet of stickers. So everybody has the option to either put a green sticker, a yellow sticker, or a red sticker. And what that basically means is if it's green, you want to be approached by new people, you want to be called on in class, you want to be um, really present and engaged at all times. For our yellows, that's folks who want to be observing, who want to be engaging by listening, um, who want to be the one to do the approaching, who are not going to feel good being approached by a new person. And for our red, it's folks who are feeling kind of shut down, who don't want to be called on in class, who need some restorative time, who may step out um, and take care of themselves in those ways, uh, and who basically just need a second to be left alone. Um, and so we let people self-determine how they want to engage in the space and um, give a really clear visual cue for folks to be able to do that without having to find the words to do it. So again, the reason that we have all of these belonging pieces for neurodiverse participants is because we have folks who've experienced it themselves um, present and ready to do it. But I'm hoping that sharing that experience with y'all means that maybe that pops up in things that you do as well. Um, now coming into like where we've not been so great, we on our board and staff have no individuals who uh, are unable to access the space physically. And that has impacted the way that we have provided accessibility. So our space, I remember Janine contacted me and was like, hey, what are you offering for um, accessibility at Riot? I've heard a lot about you, but, but it's not posted on your website. And I was like, yeah, this is what we do. Here's how we accommodate our neurodiverse participants. And there are six steps to access the space. And Janine was kind enough to say, hey, that's a little messed up, but in a kinder way than that. Uh, why, <laughs> why are there not? You were totally uh, chill about it. But um, hey, why haven't you thought about these six steps to entry? And for me, that was a really wonderful moment. Um, it's a blind spot. And if you don't have those folks represented in leadership or in your participants already, that can just continue to spiral and um, recreate itself because you never have to accommodate someone with a different experience than the ones that you've already seen. So um, I've sort of created four steps to how we dealt with that at Riot uh, after having that conversation with Janine. And for me, it's gratitude, information, what can we do now and how can this outlast me? So the first piece is when somebody gives you a piece of feedback, I know that a lot of times folks can end up in defensive mode. Um, oh, we're doing the best we can. We didn't know about this. How could we have already done this? It's important to challenge that um, and instead say, take, take a page out of Maya Angelou's book, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. So uh, practicing that gratitude, thanking the person who's brought up those blind spots to you, everyone has them and it's our responsibility as leaders to take them to heart and to make changes based on that. Uh, step two is information gathering. So what we did, uh, first things first, I didn't even know what I didn't know with our venue. I remember going back to our summer camp venue and saying, hey, am I right that there are six steps to entry? Is that possible that this is not ADA accessible here? And he was frank with me. He was like, yeah, no, we're, we're not ADA accessible. We're grandfathered in. Uh, is that a problem? And I'm like, well, yeah, that's a problem, but 
you know, it's coming up in two months now, what are we going to do? So I took a visit to the space. I uh, took stock of what the barriers to access were, and I was able to thankfully contact Janine again and say, hey, what opportunities are out there for grants? Um, what can we do to, to overcome this quickly? Um, and I looked into how much it would cost to have a ramp built, and I looked at our budget, and I said, Ugh, that's going to be hard. Um, you know, it's like a tenth of our budget. We're a small organization, but it was important. And so I was able to seek out that information. You go to people who have worked in disability and access rights um, and say, hey, like, how, how can we uh, remedy this? And so we ended up applying to uh, the Sherlock Access for All grant for a temporary ramp and for a suitcase ramp that we would be able to keep permanently. Uh, and thankfully we received that grant, but we were, before we got it, like, what are we gonna do if we don't get this grant this year? Uh, and what are we gonna do moving forward? So we had, we now have this one year fix. It's like a Band-Aid. Um, we're like, great, we have access to the space. Either we're gonna have to move spaces that next year. And that's tough for us because this, we need these really specific things at camp. We need backlines and PAs and, performance stages and that stuff can really rack up cost. And we have this good relationship. So how do we make sure that we can either find a new space or make this space accessible? And so that's where we move on past information into, or that was in the what we can do now stage. What we can do now is we can get this ramp for now, moving past into how can this outlast me stage? Um, so for us, that meant, all right, we need to think of a creative solution. Um, and we ended up contacting Jamstage and saying, hey, what if we got a permanent ramp installed for you, but you stopped charging us for using the space? Um, and that allowed us to, you know, we didn't have to find, we are able to apply for grants, you know, like we have resources as nonprofits, we can apply for grants, we can fundraise that businesses can't do necessarily. So even if you're renting your space, you still may be able to do that and work something out with them. Um, why can't we sign a contract and then make it so that we have access here uh, in the long term if we're able to trade these skills using executive director time as a grant writer to get that um, managed. You don't need to like find 15 grand in your pocket, um, which, you know, I know nonprofits out there, like we're not running with a lot of reserves. Um, we don't have a lot of extra to pull from. So um, using your creative brain to try to find ways to like make connections and outlast and, and using your access to grants because one thing that's really fundable is access. Um, and it's required um, for all of our organizations to be equitable. So that's what Riot did. We will see if we get this uh, year round grant and if not, we're back to the drawing board and we'll keep working from where we are. And, uh, we're hosting our Amp Up the Ramp fundraiser this summer, so keep an eye out for that. We'll be doing a compilation if anyone wants to buy it, uh, sponsor that ramp. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ricky. Uh, and I've been getting lots of messages in the chat about how awesome everyone has been so far in their presenting. So how you have a, you have a lot to, to live up to. I'm going to turn it back over to Janine who is going to share a little bit more, as I mentioned, about open captioning and, and sensory, sensory friendly performances and other such things. But thank you again, Ricky, for sharing Ryan's story. Yes, uh, yes thank you, Ricky, because you are just happened to be the perfect example of, of what can happen out of making a few phone calls. You know, you answered the, the survey with the great stuff you were doing, as well as the stuff that wasn't so great got in touch with each other. We worked it out. We made it happen. I got you to Sherlock. You got some money. And, you know, I mean, it's rare that things can happen that immediately and quickly. But I just felt so positive that, um, yeah, that the story worked out like that. So thank you so much for, for following up and following through on all of that in such a timely way to make things so much better for all the kids that want to go to Riot. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about what's going on in our, our local community. Um, open captioning is done at a number of places. And I think these things, while I'm showing them here, their use of in a theater setting, I think they can be used in any setting. 
everybody's always doing events. Everybody's always doing not just theater productions, but workshop presentations in their spaces and all kinds of things. So I think this goes beyond theater world into just that production world. And so open captioning is live text displayed simultaneously to the performance. And that's as opposed to closed captioning where you have to have a special device. Open captions don't require anything. Um, and the text is, is always open and to be read. Now, Trinity happens to use this LED display. Um, they've never loaned it out before, but they have talked to me saying that they would consider loaning it out to uh, a responsible, uh, reputable other organization, only because of the cost kind of stuff, if they weren't using it at the time. And what um, Teatro ECAS has done is they've built in a, uh, it, it hangs down and they project their um, language because all of their productions are in Spanish. So this serves both for open captioning and for uh, bilingual translation. Parts of these things that must be paid attention to, however, is you can't just hook these things into like a Google or a YouTube translation. You really need to have somebody who can put in the time to go through the script or to go through what the production is and really align the text then you have somebody who sits at the computer during the performance so they can advance the text in alignment with what's going on on the stage. So it really does collaborate with the live performances that happen. Um, but it's, it's great and it's, again, not that hard to do. There's lots of ways of, of going around and getting it done. Some of the other things that Mario and others talked about that I just wanna hit on is this idea of sensory friendly performances. So they are designed to create a welcoming and comfortable art experience for sensory processing disorders. So that can be folks who are autistic or on other developmental, cognitive, intellectual disabilities. The stories that are being presented, the plays, whatever, um, will not be changed, but some of the technical elements will be softened to accommodate sensitive eyes and ears. So for example, strobe lights are removed and mod other modifications include like a lower sound level. Sometimes productions have really startling or loud sounds. So they might be softened. Lights remain on at a low level in the theater because people are welcome to get up and come and go as needed during the performance. Usually there are quiet rooms that are set up outside the main performance area. And usually there are fidgets and other kinds of things provided. So at these particular sensory performances, patrons are invited and acceptable to make sounds, enter and exit as needed during performances. Um, and so out of any series of productions, you can take some of these things into consideration we Lock Theater in Massachusetts now has such ongoing sensory friendly performances. They don't even need to do separate ones any longer. But then again, like I said, it depends on what you have booked. But you, again, need to bring this in with your production crew before doing anything about the production. So these things can be built in and integrated into what you have going on. So next one, yeah. So this is an interesting piece, um, this social story narrative. Now, these were um, adapted to be used in theaters, museums, and other places, but really did come out of the autistic community and started off by putting together a narrative that had a social learning tools. So there was visual supports and a meaningful exchange of information between parents, professionals, and peoples, the individuals with autism or neurodiversity. And so they could play out any activity. A child could have like, when you wake up in the morning, this is your activity. You get out of bed, you go to the bathroom, you brush your teeth, you get dressed for school. So these things are built all over uh, a, a wide, wide range of um, activities 
that people need to accomplish. And then they were adapted um, for theater. So here's the one I pulled somewhat from uh, Christmas Carol. And these are not just used for students with disabilities. These are used for, if you have students that are traveling to Trinity on the bus, they will be able to get this ahead of time in the classroom so they'll know what they're doing. So you're going to see a show. This is what a play is if you've never been. You can bring your fidget toys. When you arrive at the theater, are you going to buy tickets? What's going to happen? There's going to be um, somebody who maybe will show you to your seat. This is maybe what the interior of the house looks like. Before we got there, maybe we even had something about, this is where you're parking. This is where the outside of the theater is. This is the door that you're going to enter. So you can break these down into as small pieces as you want. Here's where you locate the bathrooms. Here's where you locate the elevators. Here's where you locate the quiet room in case you need to take a break into whatever's going on. So it takes you through the whole um, experience of when you leave the space that you are currently in and know and are comfortable in through what will happen over the course of this event. Now, this particular word, social story, has now been copyrighted by this woman, Carol Gray, and this is her website. She has a whole extensive list of things of what actually combines a social story. So there is a whole sort of, again, a checklist that says all of the things that you put in. But if you go online, you will also see many other kinds of social narratives that um, you can adapt for whatever you're doing. So even again, if it's not a play, here's the outside of the Children's Museum. You're gonna go in, you're gonna buy a ticket. Here's the different rooms that you can go into. So through this, you remove a lot of anxiety and they also work with a lot of older folks who maybe have gotten some Alzheimer's dementia and don't remember some of these things that they maybe used to do more frequently. But again, it makes everybody comfortable with the, um, the event. And is that my last slide, Howie? Uh, before Howie? Oh, this. I love this slide. So <laughs> third world problems. But somebody spent a lot of time thinking about what a ramp was, painting the idea for what an accessible ramp would be. But somehow, rather than building the ramp, they just painted it on the stairway that was already there. And I think this shows a little bit of the confusion of the world that we're still living in, that people have good intentions and sometimes they just get sort of side waylaid. And so some of what I want us to think about over these past couple of days and moving forward is that what does it mean for artists with disabilities to thrive? Since we had and need exposure to great art performances, it's great to do a million things for the audience and what that looks like, because we need to be able to understand what a high-end performance is. But we also now need to be able to make the leap from allowing people with disabilities to be in our audience, to allowing people with disabilities to be our performers, to be our teachers, to be our directors, to be on our staffs. And that pipeline locally in Rhode Island has not yet really been built. But I'm hoping <laughs> through um, the risk of grants that everybody's going to be applying for, where there is a space in that grant where you can write down in the narrative, here's two or three things we were thinking about doing within this project over the next year to improve our access. And in, in uh, collating with that, on the other side, in the budget, you actually have a line for access. So you could budget something in. So some low hanging fruit might be, you want to do a narrative story about what it will take to get people to come into your space. People are always worried when they do outreach, if people are going to be comfortable in their space. There is a first step, telling them what it would take, putting that on your website and putting it in folders and getting the word out 
So at least people will know where they're going and how they can adapt to that. So within this risk uh, grant you'll be applying for, some of those steps can be taken. And again, as Holly will go into and as Riot already did, collaboration is the way to go. We all have diverse abilities. And so we can all excuse me, take those diverse abilities and bring them together in partnership with RISCA to really improve the landscape that all our arts and culture is moving in. So now, Howie. Thank you, Janine. And uh, Howie, I will let you take it away from here. Howie is the executive director of the Steelyard. And we're very excited to have you here today, Howie. Go for it. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you. I'm kind of humbled to be here. Those were amazing presentations so far. And I've learned a lot today. So thank you for um, having me, inviting me to join this conversation. I'm going to talk a little bit um, tactically about some of the strategies that the Steelyard has used over a 20 year history. Um, but I'm gonna start with a, a brief introduction. I'm, I'm Howie Snyder. I'm the executive director of the Steelyard. I use he, him pronouns. Um, and the Steelyard, for those of you who don't know, uh, is pictured here in sort of an above view. It's an industrial site uh, from 1902 to 2002. This was the home of Providence Steel and Iron. Um, prior to that, it was a, an undeveloped wetland along the shores of the Wenasquatucket River, um, you know, probably previously. And it, it's been a, it's a gathering place. It's a former brownfields and in, in educational um, environment where people get together to learn and practice the industrial arts. Um, hold on, I don't know how to change slides. There we go. So, you know, here's a little bit about our mission and our vision. Um, the Steelyard's historic campus is a platform for professional artists, makers, and the community to practice and learn the industrial arts. We foster creative economic opportunities by providing workspace tools, training, and education while forging lasting links to a local tradition of craftsmanship, right? And, and there's nothing explicitly in that that says, you know, who we're doing this for, why, how, how we do what we're doing. Um, but we have a vision that, you know, we believe in the world made by hands, where individuals, neighbors, businesses, municipalities, communities come together to experience the process to enrich our lives and public spaces. Um, and I think in the vision is really this implied value that we, we want to, um, we want to make this as accessible as possible and as inclusive and expansive as possible. And pictured on the right, is um, the final group from our um, Camp Sparkle a couple of years ago. It's a, that's the culmination of a two week welding and jewelry class for LGBTQ uh, 14 to 18 year olds who come together um, to have a safe space and a brave space to practice and learn together. Um, I've got, I, I was thinking about where we started as an organization, right? Why the question that Janine initially said to me too, you know, thinking, why does an ableist sort of organization get into access and inclusion? Like, what, what is the impetus? And I think a lot of it comes from um, our commitment to public spaces and public art. And pictured here are two different projects that, you know, may not look, you know, on the surface like they, um, well, they were opportunities for inclusive design. Right? We design a lot of trash cans, bike racks, benches, fences, picnic tables, things that go out into public spaces. And we've always wanted to make sure that those are safe and accessible to the broadest possible community. So even when designing a public trash can, you know, there's an ADA opportunity there, right? You can buy a trash can that's been designed and, and um, produced by a manufacturer and hopefully they've considered the ADA implications of it so that somebody from a wheelchair um, somebody walking by, people of different sizes and stature are able to access the trash can itself and use it. And there are federal standards and ADA guides to sort of help with that. And even projects pictured on the left is a, um, a chess table that we made, you know, where we fabricated the steel. We had an artist do this beautiful mosaic tile top, and we decided to leave one of the benches off and this is it's not a coincidence there's not a seat missing that's a seat at the table um, that someone could use if they need a wheelchair or if they 
are want to play chess from their wheelchair. And we had to think about how someone's legs would fit under the table so that they could reach appropriately and be able to actually move the chess pieces on the table should they have to. So those kinds of, um, that kind of practice of us being producers of public art and thinking about inclusion, I think started us down that path. Um, but our founders also always believed that um, industrial arts should be available to everyone, regardless of their background or previous experience. And it just took a long time to take a formerly industrial site that was never set up for that access to turn it into um, something that is. So pictured here on the, on the left is the ramp we added to our building in 2018, um, which was the first time that the sort of main entrance of the building was fully accessible. And this is a, in, you know, an ADA access ramp um, but it was also an opportunity for art and design. And, and we really see that, you know, doing something to include a broader community in your programs or in your sites um, can also be an opportunity to support and engage artists and continue to communicate some of the cultural ideas that you really express. Um, so we were able to, our trainees in our job training program uh, were able to design and fabricate uh, the handrails and the custom sort of decoration that goes onto the ramp. And pictured on the right are the uh, ADA accessible restrooms that we added um, to supplement the restrooms that had been there for the previous, you know, 100 years um, that were only accessible up six stairs, you know, similar to sort of Ricky's challenge. There was no way to get to a restroom. For from I think 2014 onward, we used to just keep an ADA accessible portage on on the site at the steel yard at all times. And that was the closest we could get to accommodating people because we knew that there was no restroom they could get to. And ADA portage ons are not ideal um, for anyone. Um, but it, you know, we we recognized the need and it took us a long time to get there. Um, and obviously all the, all the solutions I'm showing you here, right? These are like things that are done and funded thanks to RISCA, thanks to Sherlock Center, thanks to uh, the DEM and other folks who sort of showed up to do this. Um, it didn't happen overnight. So here you can see on the left, our ADA ceramics wheel uh, with the red stool in front of it that we installed um, again during studio renovations a couple of years ago. And it's another one of those, um, accidental or surprise accommodations that the whole community enjoys on a lot of different levels. The ceramics wheel in front of the red stool can raise and lower so that someone can access it from a wheelchair. It also turns out that once we installed that in the studio, a lot of people who were having back issues leaning over a ceramics wheel, um, you know, artists who were who are older or have had previous injuries, turns out they really like that wheel also. And they'll take the time to crank it up so they can use it from a standing position or they can lean on a stool and use it. And it ends up accommodating their lifestyle and their needs in a way that we never anticipated, but has been um, really great to see. And just reminded me of sort of the curb cut story, you know, serving one audience and thinking about accommodations, um, other opportunities exist. But I also want to talk a little bit about the challenges of doing ADA um, accommodations. You know, it was great that we got a ceramics wheel and we could find a company that made one and order it. But on the right, you see our um, ADA jewelry bench. And that was something we could not find commercially available. We wanted to do it. We wanted to buy one. We had these beautiful jewelry benches that we got from a local manufacturer but we went out on the open market, we could not find a wheelchair accessible jewelry bench. So it took us a little longer than just ordering from a catalog, but what we did was we raised some money, we took the time to develop a design and hire local artists um, to work with, um, a, you know, with an artist in a wheelchair to come up with what would the ideal jewelry bench be and how can we make it? And um, eventually we were able to design and fabricate that jewelry bench you see there, which is broadly accessible. Um, and again, we had to adapt some technology to do it, but we knew it could happen. And we knew that we had the interest in making our jewelry studio uh, fully accessible. And access also goes beyond just what we do in our studios, right? There's a 
we want to make sure that the outreach and engagement um, can attract and support the community we want. And I love the, the social storytelling, um, which, you know, is sort of a, a lens that I think we've, we could apply and should apply a little more to our website um, and to, uh, you know, the things that we put out in the community. But we got this idea uh, from another organization, Vermont Studio Center, of doing an accessibility guide. And they did a great job if you arrive at Vermont Studios as a um, as an artist and resident who needs accommodations of any sort they have an accessibility guide that'll walk you through all these great services so we got the idea and brought it to Janine we're asking some questions how can we go about doing this we're actually able to find um, she connected us to a graphic designer who's also a wheelchair user and was able to both provide exceptional design services um, but also give some interiority and some um, some share some of his experience as um, a wheelchair user to to make sure that we were really hitting on some of the main topics um, and the accessibility guide at the steel yard will share that as a resource with everybody um, is something that people can look at before they arrive at the steel yard again to understand what's going to happen understand what accommodations are available map of the restrooms and sites and things like that and we also designed to go with it a training program for our teachers and students um, or teachers and staff to understand sort of what some of those accommodations are that we're expected to give. Um, got three more slides, so I won't take up too much more time, but I wanted to talk a little bit like everyone else did about sort of future accessibility goals. We're putting in a bottle filling station um, that's going to be, you know, accessible with a reach. We have a new entrance for our community art building coming soon because although our studio is accessible, um, we have an office, our administrative offices are only accessible through a temporary ramp. And we know that that's not ideal, that you know, even a temporary ramp helps someone get in, into the building. But, um, but you know, we, we plan to own this property and operate it as a nonprofit for a long time. So we're raising the money to make the infrastructural step of actually adding an ADA entrance to um, our community art building, which is where our offices are. We're gonna update the accessibility guide probably every couple of years because language changes. I think we've talked a lot today about language and um, making sure that we have people first language and making sure that that language is updated along with um, accessibility needs because the ongoing conversations are really what drives it. Um, and our studio director just said the other day, he was giving a tour to um, some folks from the South County Art Center who are working on an accessible ceramic studio. He said, you know, the what we need to do is keep listening, keep asking questions, and make sure that we have, uh, whether it's board members or community members, uh, to help support us and share the feedback. And, I, and Ricky, I loved your um, quote too, that we're, we're grateful for that feedback and we're gonna do what we can to implement it. Um, and when we can find the resources and having the plans for it ahead of time makes all the difference. So the other thing that we're, I'm excited to announce too is through the Sherlock Center, we have scholarships for people living with disabilities. And that, you know, a lot of people who are living with disabilities um, are also um, receiving other, ha have challenges to work, have financial challenges. There's financial barriers across all sectors of the community and trying to make sure that um, we lower the cost and make the very public invitation that and let people know. Because I've also heard from people who said, you know, when I came, when I heard about the steel yard accessibility, I assume that just meant the ceramics department. And you can see pictured here, you know, uh, Tina from uh, Real Access Motivates Progress welding on a project in our studio. Um, and really we've, we've tried to think holistically again about like who can access these um, services and how. So having those scholarships will help drive that community and support them. All right, two more slides. And this one is an announcement that uh, on, May 24th at 1130 AM in Kennedy Plaza, we're gonna be unveiling a sculptural table uh, designed by the Steel Yard and Tina Peterson. It's called Tina's Table. It's an ADA accessible um, picnic table that is designed so that everyone who sits at it is in a wheelchair or looks to be in a wheelchair. It's a, it's a sculptural piece designed, thought to sort of increase conversations about accessibility. And the unveiling is gonna be a great 
event to uh, to meet people to do some advocacy. Uh, the mayor is going to be there, lieutenant governor, and some other folks. So if you have any interest in continuing this conversation with any of them for doing your own advocacy, um, I think it could be a great opportunity. And also mark your calendars for um, September 10th this year at the Steel Yard. We're going to be hosting the second annual Accessibility is Beautiful event. And uh, this is not an event that the Steel Yard uh, runs, uh, Ramp really runs this event. Um, but they are bringing together vendors, um, artists, performers who have different accommodations and, and uh, different abilities to uh, present solutions, exchange ideas, figure out how to connect businesses to the services that you need to be accessible. Um, and it's been an amazing, you know, the, developing these kinds of resources and these kinds of relationships has but what's been able to help the steel yard find the grant support we need and find the projects um, that really align on a more expansive future for us as an organization. So I'll leave it with that, but wanted to thank you all again for sharing your ideas and um, back over to you, Todd. Thank you, Howie, that was wonderful. And thank you all of our presenters today. Yes, yes. Uh, so we know this is a lot of information and I've been getting a lot of great messages from you all being like, this is so great. So we have some time for Q&A now. Also, we understand that you might be processing this. So no pressure if you don't have questions for now. You'll be able to follow up with me and perhaps with others on this call about things they've done as you kind of ruminate on stuff. So just opening up the floor, as you saw, if you were able to see the messages in the chat, um, feel free to unmute and ask questions if you have them now you'd like to ask, or feel free to drop them in the chat. And I would just like to follow up Howie's encouragement to come to that event in the fall. I think that as part of these workshop things that we're doing, Todd and I will um, tag on and collaborate to send you all out specific information about it. I think it would be a great place for all of us to go get together, do a little networking, um, again, engage in the community and there will pe be people there from RAMP and others just to sort of, you know, mingle and socialize, because I think that's a lot of ways that questions come up and questions get answered. Great, thank you, Janine. Any questions from the Zoom room? Feel free to unmute. I'll also wax eloquent for a minute more to give you all time in case you do have questions and uh, remind you all in the email reminder for this session, you received some information about the variance exhibit that will be at the RISD Museum until the fall. Connor Moynihan, uh, who is a curator of that exhibit, that's uh, art uh, by and about people with disabilities, uh, will be offering a free tour on this Saturday from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, Janine and Arts Equity Rhode Island are arranging for tickets for anyone who wants to attend for free. Uh, I'm going to drop a link into the chat that if you're curious about that, uh, it's just a simple sign up form. Uh, I'll be sending people RSVP uh, that list to Connor on Friday, this Friday, uh, in preparation for Saturday. So just respond to that survey by this Friday if you're interested. Let me see. And the show is brilliant, and Connor is really somebody you want to meet and talk to. He has a really great take on things, and it's great that he will now be staying at the RISD Museum to uh, do more. But the show is fabulous. All right. I'm not seeing any questions, which, again, is totally fine. A lot of gratitude, which is definitely welcome, because today's session was fantastic. Janine, thank you so much for organizing this. Mario, Ricky, and Howie. Uh, so Todd. Stories. Yeah, how, uh, Mario. Sorry, there's actually a question in the chat. Oh, is there? Okay. Yeah, somebody was asking about the accessibility guide and how is it made accessible. Um, you know, we've just, we, we knew a couple of years ago we wanted to do an accessibility guide and it took a, it's taken a long time to get it ready and prepared. Um, we will, it is on our website. Um, we have a, a link to it that Todd will share with all the resources um, going out after this. It's a PDF right now that can be downloaded, um, which, you know, our whole website can be translated into like 20 different languages or 50 different languages by Google. But the accessibility guide, unfortunately, is a PDF, which can't be that. So that's one challenge that we've already recognized that we need to fix. 
but it will be downloadable. Um, and as we do scholarships, as we roll out the new scholarship opportunities and we do some press around the accessibility upgrades we've made to the studio, we'll be sharing that. Um, and we're hoping to have printed copies of it as well. It was designed to be printed and digital um, so that uh, folks can actually have it at, in, their, in their possession at the steel yard and sort of share with others. And we haven't gotten there yet. So, you know, the, those are our steps in the process, uh, but we're hoping to do some kind of release and share that information. Great, thanks, yeah. Abby. Any other questions? And I would encourage folks, because I know some people came today that may have not been able to go to last week's um to, to spend a little time go online to where todd will direct you to see um last week's discussion um there was more practical things in this one but they really do i think fit together nicely to give a, an overview of what the whole um community looks like and where we're we've come from and where we're going and i think I'll wrap things up, but there's no more questions, which is saying what's going to come next, as Janine was alluding to. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Nuando had the question of um, any accessibility guides and best practices for physical spaces, events, meetings, online meetings, et cetera, would be helpful. So Janine and I are developing some resource pages that will live on the RISCO mm -hmm. website. I'm aspiring to have those up by the end of the week, but um, realistically, it might be in the next week or two. Uh, you'll receive some resources today in a follow up email once I upload the recording and as Janine mentioned the recording from last week as well. Those things will exist and live on our website and will also be a part of a page that's accessed through our project grants for organizations uh, mm -hmm. application. Uh, in the question that Janine mentioned that was developed about you know the ways in which you're providing access to your project. Uh, as a way to give people ideas when they're working on their applications and get them thinking in that direction as you all have been thinking this direction uh, through the course of the Zoom and, and beyond. Um, so that information will be sent to you, access guides will be sent to the access pages, resource pages will be sent to you once they're ready as well. And stay tuned, uh, Janine and I are gonna continue to do this work together and we'll continue to develop exciting things depending on what needs you all have. Janine, you have something to share? I just wanted to mention that one of our goals, and I um, imagine we will be waiting for Riska to bring on a new director, is actually to put together what we're temporarily calling a task force. And this task force will be of um, folks with disabilities from diverse categories of disability, diverse categories of art forms, and all of those kinds of things. So hopefully that not just as paper on a website or distributable, there will be a, a, a living format of doing that. And when we get an opportunity after, like I said, the new directors come on, we will be sending out a call all over the state so people can um, recommend people that they know or people that they are, you could self recommend. And um, so we want this to be a, a, an ongoing living entity, not just a pop-up once in a while workshop. Howie, did you have something you want to share? Very quick. I just wanted to share something Janine told me yesterday that I, I can't oh. stop thinking about, which is the phrase, um, nothing about us without us. Yeah. And that, you know, the concept, any of the things we've done at the Steel Yard, we haven't done in a vacuum. There's, you know, Tina Peterson from Ramp and others in the community are willing to do a walkthrough or a roll through and come look at a space and sort of help um, with those kind of challenges. And I just love that call to action, nothing about us without us. And that, you know, there's, every time I think about it, I, you know, imagine someone else who can be part of that conversation. Um, so thank you for sharing that with me, Janine. Thank you, Howie. And I think that's a great place for us to wrap up. Janine, was there mm -hmm. anything else you wanted to share before we shut down for today? No, nope, just thanks to everybody. I really do appreciate you coming along for the ride. And again, thank and you. And thanks to Todd for reeling us all in. Thank My you. My pleasure. That was, that was huge, Todd. It really was. We really appreciate it. No, no problem. Uh, and thank you, Janine, Mario, Howie, and Ricky today for sharing. 
Uh, have a great Wednesday, everyone. You'll receive a follow-up from me later today, and this conversation will keep on keeping on. So talk again soon. Great. Thank you.